such good news uh, for us. It was good to see a few of you wince when uh, Joe read that last verse. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the wrong. This is the third in a series of sermons on why I am not a Christian. And uh, last week we looked at the problem of Christians themselves. And uh, today, you were marvelous examples uh, last week. Um, and today we look at uh, Scripture. And uh, in our text, we just noticed a problem sometimes where people see certain uh, violence in Scripture and one of the issues sometimes people have with it. And our next lesson uh, has a, another dimension to it as well. Esther chapter uh, 9, and invite you to turn back the pages uh, a little bit to Esther, and that's right after Nehemiah, uh, but before Job. Uh, our Bibles have different numberings, but mine is around 449, uh, Esther chapter 9. And I want to read uh, some verses from, from this uh, part of Scripture. Let me give a little context. Uh, uh, Esther tells the stories, uh, story of Jews in Persia. And Haman, who's been part of the court, has convinced the king to have the first recorded pogrom of Jews. He wanted to annihilate all the Jews. And because he hated uh, a Jewish leader named Mordecai. So a day was set to kill all the Jews. Now, before that happens, Esther, who is Mordecai's relative, becomes queen. And she gets the king to reverse the decision. And what we read uh, follows, follows this. Now, in the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, on the 30th, 13th day when the king's command and edict were about to be executed, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain power over them, but which had been changed to a day when the Jews would gain power over their foes. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who had sought their ruin, and no one could understand them, because could withstand them, excuse me, because the fear of them had fallen upon all peoples. All the officials of the provinces, the satraps and the governors and the royal officials, were supporting the Jews because the fear of Mordecai had fallen upon them. For Mordecai was powerful in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces as the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. So the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, slaughtering and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 people. They killed Parshandetha, Dalphon, Aspetha, Poretha, Adelia, Aridetha, Parmashta, Arasai, Aradai, Vesatha. Joe, aren't you glad you didn't have to read that tonight? Okay. <laughs> the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they did not touch the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king. The king said to Queen Esther, in the citadel of Susa, the Jews have killed 500 people and also the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? They've had a whole day of slaughter. What further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, if it pleases the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict and let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 persons in Susa, but they did not touch the plunder. Now the other Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and gained relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. And after that, the Feast of Purim is inaugurated to commemorate that day. Wow, what a text. I'm not even reading Joshua for you uh, today. Brian McLaren, who is a pastor on the East Coast, uh, talks about how the Bible can be very difficult to understand, especially for people who are new to it, spiritual seekers. And he shares in his, uh, his book on evangelism, I, I think it's a good, good little book, 
called uh, More Ready Than You Realize, Evangelism as Dance in the Postmodern Matrix. He talks about speaking to a gathering of Chinese scholars who have been trained in, under a kind of a Maoist philosophical framework and for whom religious people are always, in their mind, female, old, and uneducated. That was their experience. So they were quite surprised to hear this man, Brian McLaren, um, who was uh, young, male, and educated, talking to them. And uh, after he was done talking, McLaren uh, had one of the scholars came up to him and talked about how he had tried, he, he had begun reading what he called the book Bible. And he says this to McLaren, McLaren. He says, I think this is very bad for me. I think this book Bible makes me go away from believing in the God. And McLaren asked him, why is that? He replied, because I read about how the God tell the Jewish people they must kill all non-Jewish people around them, even the mothers and little children. I think to myself, if my ancestors are so unlucky and they live near Jewish people, the God would, kill, the God would say, kill them too, and then I would not exist. So the book Bible makes me feel this God is not for me or my people. Now, is the Bible a book for you? I am no more Jewish than that professor from Shanghai. My Celtic ancestors come from an even more distant uh, culture. And yet it's not a foreign book to me. It's, it's my story. I've grown up with it. But for many people, the Bible is foreign territory and can be very difficult, particularly when it appears to be misogynistic, genocidal, narrow, and plagued with violence. Is the Bible a book for you? And I want to say it can be, but... You first need to learn to read it appropriately. And even more importantly, let it read you. Let me tell you what I want to do today. I don't want to offer a defense for the scriptures. I think I'll score a few points along the way. But what I want to do is I simply want to talk about how to read and how to read the Bible in an appropriate way. Get you stimulated. I'm not going to answer all the questions but I think uh, there are some things we have to do when we're approaching this book. And I've listed them in the sermon notes. I have four things I want to say. And the first thing I want to say in reading the Bible, it's very important to pay attention to context. There's all kinds of context, literary context and so on, but I'm interested in historical context. That is recognizing that every part of Scripture is written within a culture, in a certain history with a geography, with a certain language. And whenever you take divine inspiration and put it in human language, it's going to be within that culture and reflect somewhat that culture. I like what John Polkinghorne, who's a mathematical physicist from Cambridge and an Anglican priest, he says this about Scripture. Scripture is more inspiration than dictation. It's inspiration rather than dictation. Divine truth that comes within the limited cultural expressions and understanding of its authors. So it's divine truth, but it still has to come in human words. There's no way around this, around this folks. Uh, God cannot speak to us in any other way than in language. And once you articulate words, you're talking about culture because language is a part of a culture. And once you start talking about culture, you're talking about history and the limits of certain historical and, historical and geographical locations. Uh, so scripture comes to us within that kind of cultural matrix. Uh, for instance, Christians understand the, the Bible much different than uh, most Muslims understand the Quran or Mormons understand the Book of Mormon. For them, those are books of dictation. Not for, Bible for Christians is not that. That's why I think its power comes from it. It translates so well. It's not dictation. The writers are inspired by God. And we understand the Holy Spirit to be active in that, and they see. And then they try to give expression to what they see in words they know. So divine truth, but within the cultural uh, uh, and the limited expression and understanding 
of, of its authors. You know, there are parts of Joshua that make me shudder, where God not only, the Jewish God not only allows uh, genocide, but commands it. Now, I'm not trying to make excuses for that, but one has got to read the book of Joshua with a wider understanding of just how violent that world was. And understand that in the ancient Mideast, the Jews were the punk on the playground, the little kid on the playground. And when you get beat up every time you go home from school, you have a certain mindset. And so when you tell stories about God's victory for you, you're going to tell that within the language and culture of your time. We can see some of this uh, cultural context and historical context in the lesson we just read. Um, this is chapter 9, I hate this chapter in, in uh, Esther. You know, uh, not only the J Jews get a whole day of slaughter, but they get another day. And they get a holiday thrown in to celebrate it. But you can recognize in the context of the story that the Jews come within a hair of being completely annihilated themselves. And so it's within that context that we understand this story. You've got to pay attention to context. If you think the Bible is violent, you ought to read some of the ancient, other ancient religious traditions that come out of the Mideast. It makes this stuff look like a picnic. The command in, uh, the legal command in the five books of Moses, so we call it the Lex Talionis, it's the eye for eye, tooth for tooth uh, 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 rule, a law. We look at that as a primitive, outdated, uh, tit for tat kind of ethic. In reality, in its time, it was an ethical advance. It was beyond the earlier legal thinking and made sure that punishment did not exceed the crime. And so it was a step forward in progress. Many people think that Paul was a sexist in the New Testament. Let me tell you something. He was. And so was everybody else. If you think Paul was a sexist, you ought to read Aristotle. In fact, I'm going to give you a little Aristotle. If you turn on the back of the sermon notes, and I've shared this before, but I think it's a wonderful uh, little uh, setting. In the New Testament, we often have descriptions of how husbands and wives are to treat each other. It's part of what's called the household table. Uh, the economics, the word economics comes from household rules. And in the ancient world, the location of economics was in the house. And so there's all this description in the ancient world and in the New Testament of how husbands and wives are to treat each other, male uh, children and fathers, and masters and slaves. It's called the household table. It's not scripture. It's in scripture, but God didn't invent it. It's just part of the culture. And what I want to show you is just how Aristotle dealt with the household rules. He says, uh, this is from his ethics, authority and subordination are conditions not only inevitable but also expedient. In some cases, things are marked out from the moment of birth to rule and to be ruled. And then he goes on later. Hence, there are by nature various classes of rulers and ruled. For the free rules the slave. Here's the threefold uh, uh, couplet of, of the household table. The free rules the slave, the male, the female, and the man, the child, in a different way. And all possess the various parts of the soul, but possess them in different ways. For the slave has not got the deliberative part at all. And the female has it, but without full authority. While the child has it, but in an undeveloped form. And then this uh, wonderful sentence of enlightenment. There's no such thing as injustice in the absolute sense towards what is one's own. Chattel, slave. Hence, there can be no injustice towards them. So that's 300 years before Paul, dealing with household rules. Now, Paul is going to deal with this as well, and he does it in a couple other places in the New Testament. But what I have here is from Ephesians 5. I misprinted. It's not, boy, I, I misprinted a lot of stuff this week. It's Ephesians 5, not Ephesians 3. And notice, though, before Paul talks about, talking about, starts talking about masters and slaves, fathers and children, and husbands and wives, verse 21, it's very key, it says, be subject to one another out of reverence for crime. And that's the thesis statement. And then Paul outlines that. He talks about wives submitting to husbands. And then he spills three times as much ink instructing husbands on how to love their wives. And then he talks about the other relationships as well. Uh, but when you notice how much Paul talks about husbands loving wives, it's very interesting. Now, was Paul a sexist? He sure was. 
Was it a sexist culture? You bet it was. But you can see, and I think you can see this in Colossians as well, but you particularly see it in Ephesians, that Paul has had an encounter with the risen Christ. He's caught a glimpse of the kingdom of God, and so he's going to take the common household ethics of his world, and they are transformed, and you can see a trajectory right here in Ephesians chapter 5 of mutual submission and equality between the genders. In fact, the early church, all the churches that Paul started, they had women leaders. Jesus was the first rabbi on record to have women disciples. And uh, I just think to use this text as a, uh, uh, as, a, as a sexist text is unfair, and to treat Paul as a sexist and dismiss him is unfair. Was he a sexist? You bet he was. Was Abraham Lincoln a racist? He sure was. We don't dismiss him. We treasure him. But we recognize. He was in a cultural world, had certain views of African Americans that we wouldn't accept today at all. Divine truth coming within the limits of a culture and language and the limited understanding of its authors. I know I'm not answering all the questions about the violence and uh, the bigotry in the Bible, but I think it's a start. You've got to pay attention to context. Another thing I think it's very important to do in reading Scripture is to listen to the Bible with others. I'll never forget in seminary back east uh, when I was reading, uh, we were studying uh, the Exodus story and listening to, uh, studying it, that with uh, African-American students. And boy, did that open my eyes. You know, in the black church in American history, in the black church... America was not understood to be the promised land as much as it was in, in our white historical understanding. There's all that documentation about the promised land. You, do, you, do you know what America was in the black church? America was Egypt. And so when you're reading these Exodus stories with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ from a little uh, uh, different ethnic side of things, boy, that's, that story has a little different ring to it. And uh, words about freedom and liberation in those texts stand out quite a bit. There's an old uh, Reformation. Oh, no, I'm gonna, that's later. Never mind. Um, I just think it's, it's so important to listen with others. Oh, here's what I want to say. Um, I think this is what makes connecting groups uh, so helpful in small groups. You, you, you know, every text has a certain context, but you have your context, too. You come with your framework, with your pair of ears and eyes, and they're limited. It's so much better to come with other sets of eyes and ears. Our men's, uh, Tuesday men's group uh, just finished the book of Ecclesiastes. Boy, some of us do not like that book, and it's very cynical. Others of us, uh, especially those of us in midlife, find it very interesting and uh, speaking to us a lot. That was me. Uh, but boy, coming together and wrestling with that text from our different backgrounds and and perspective. I think we listen better. A woman was reading in a scripture service, uh, uh, one Advent, I read about this recently, and uh, she was reading the story of Mary and Joseph. And she was sharing the part where Joseph was pondering, disposing of Mary once he discovered she was with child. And the woman read part of that story, and then she was right at the, the lectern. She put the Bible down, and she said, you know, when I was 17, I got pregnant and was forced to have an abortion. I've always wondered who that child would have grown up to be. And the church, the small church, they just stopped the service, and they gathered around her and prayed for her. Now that woman hears that text out of her own context, with her pair of ears. I'll never forget the first time I heard Pastor Jan preach on Mary and the birth of Jesus. Some of you don't know Pastor Jan. She was a, uh, our associate pastor and, and one of our associate pastors and just went to go to God's promised land in Hilton Head, South Carolina. So <laughs> We miss her dearly, but we're carrying on. And I'll never forget hearing her preach. I'd never heard a woman preach on those texts. She brought stuff to that text that even John Calvin never could have done, or Martin Luther. Listening together, I think, opens the text to us. Not only want to listen with others, but we want to listen to all of the Bible. 
And this is the third thing I want to say. We want to read the whole of Scripture. If I was Brian McLaren and I had that Chinese scholar come up to me, I would have challenged him to read all of the Old Testament, and especially Amos. There's a Jewish prophet. He didn't hold his punches. He let the powerful know they had to take care of the rich or not oppress them. And Amos made clear to the power players in the Jewish tradition, God, God is not your God only, but God of the nations. I would have talked about Jesus, who gives the last word on violence in his pres prescription for peacemaking in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, there's this is the thing I want to say about the Reformation. There's an old Reformation principle. Scripture interprets Scripture. You want to listen to all of it so you can get the whole gist, the whole enchilada, as we like to say. You want to listen to the whole counsel of God. And when you do that, you, it's interesting. You find out there's a lot of theological debates and discussions and disagreement within the Scriptures themselves. The book of Job in the Old Testament is a polemic against a certain kind of theology. And that theology... Uh, that Job argues with is a theology that says when bad things happen to you, that's you getting punished because of some sin you did. That is the theology of Psalm 1, basically. And Job is a counter to that. It's a polemic against it. Jesus rejected the eye-for-eye, tooth-for-tooth principle of the Old Testament. He's explicit about that in the Sermon on the Mount. There's an interplay, and we need to listen to the whole counsel of God. Look, I'm not... I'm not saying there aren't criticisms of the Bible that we can lodge. What I am saying uh, is in encouraging us is to um, stick with the text. Get with the conversation. Let the text, uh, meet the text and engage it. And let the text engage you. And this is the key, I think, in reading the scripture, is to let the scriptures read you. It's not simply about reading a text at a distance, but allowing that text to read your life, to shape your life, to challenge and send your life into the kingdom. That's what the scriptures are about. Eugene Peterson has written a book on, uh, um, you're getting a whole dose here. You get McLaren, you get Eugene Peterson, and yeah, Frederick Buechner and C.S. Lewis next week. But uh, Eugene Peterson, he wrote a wonderful book, came out a couple of years ago called Eat This Book and on how to read the Bible. And uh, he says this, the most important question we ask of this text, he's talking about a scripture passage, the most important question we ask of this text is, text is not what does this mean, but what can I obey? A simple act of obedience will open up our lives to this text far more quickly than any number of Bible studies and dictionaries and concordances. So what can I obey? And then he goes on to say, and not that the study is not important. A Jewish rabbi I once studied with would often say, for us Jews, studying the Bible is more important than obeying it because if you don't understand it rightly, you will obey it wrongly and your obedience will be disobedience. And Eugene Peterson says, this also is true. But I think he has a point. You know, the question is asked, what can I obey? When Jesus tells you you have to love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you, you know, that's either airy-fairy junk or something else. You'll never know unless you actually pray for someone who hates your guts or actually try to love someone who you cannot stand, not just to pour salt on their wounds but actually try to love them. Then if you do that, then you're in the kingdom. That's how the scriptures work. As someone once said, you can't prove the promises of God in advance, but if you live them, you find they're true, every one. Peterson goes on to, to, to share about this guy. Um, I don't know if get his name right. Anthony Plakados is a 35-year-old truck driver and ended up in his church. He, Grew up in a Greek family, nominally Catholic, and never rubbed off on him. But he got converted, and he told Peterson he'd never read a book, but after his conversion, he went out and got a little fine, small print King James Bible, read it three times that year. Just was on fire. His wife didn't get it. His wife, Mary, was, was raised proper Presbyterian, uh, Sunday school, and uh, for her, religion was definitions and explanations. And she just, could, you know, she, and, and Anthony could not answer her questions. And so he'd often get Pastor Peterson to come over. And Peterson says this. Uh, he says, uh, I was noticed... Oh, no, that's the wrong picture. Okay. Sorry. 
With Mary's, when Mary's questions got too difficult for Anthony, he would invite me over to the, the, their trailer home, papered with Elvis Presley posters to help him out. One evening, the subject was the parables. Mary wasn't getting it. I was trying to tell her how to read them, how to make sense out of them. I wasn't getting on very well, and Anthony interrupted. He said, Mary, you got to live them, and you'll understand them. You can't figure them out from the outside. You got to get inside them or let them get inside you. That guy knew how to read the Bible. You want to get inside it. Let it get inside you. There's really no other way. And that's what we do with all great art, all great literature. And I think scripture is a lot more than that. But you want to let it have an impact on you. You can't read it from a distance. Look, can the Bible be your story? I think it is. It's my story. But that's not at arm's length. If it's going to be your story, you got to let it get inside you. And let yourself get inside it. And I hope you will. Well, I hope I've raised a lot of questions for you. Email me. It costs me out in the patio. And let's talk more about how we read scriptures. Uh, uh, can I have an amen? amen.